uh, Tutin Orbeline would like to welcome you to how to be your own therapist. And we'd like to thank Miffy Maximilian um, for, for being with us tonight. If you have not taken one of her classes, um, you're in for a treat. She has this beautiful way of um, translating uh, Eastern into Western um, speak. So thank you, Miffy. Um, we're glad to have you one more time. Well, I'm I'm thrilled to be back. I, I'm so so happy to um, have you hosting me. It's really lovely. Uh, so yeah, we're kind of embarking on uh, an eight week series of nice informal discussions. I've got um, a couple of uh, topics that I thought would be beneficial for be your own therapist. Uh, but I'm also relying very much on if you have your own burning questions as well. Uh, so I thought, um, you know, the, the whole topic of be your own therapist actually is fantastic because, um, for one, who can afford to pay their own therapist? Well, nobody really. Um, so that's kind of out of the out of the picture and here in Australia there's a waiting list for a therapist so you never get one when you actually need one you've got to hang in there for eight months until you, you bumped up the queue or two and a half years even um, but from a Buddhist psychology point of view uh, Buddhist psychology is radically different fundamentally different from Western psychology because we can be our own therapist um, the whole world view is different. Instead of these people are well and these people are mentally ill, everybody's mentally ill. <laughs> We're all on a spectrum. Some of us hold it together more than others. Some of us have crises at one time and not at another time. But from a Buddhist point of view, we're all on this spectrum of mental illness. And how do we know? Because we suffer. If we have suffering, it means there's something's wrong. There's, there's disease mental unwellness in our heart uh, the other radical thing from buddhist psychology is that uh, we can be cured and this is something that uh, western psychology doesn't even go near they never say you can be cured all you can do is just make do just pass in society um, just learn to live with all of your sufferings and problems and not muck up too much you know just 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 shut up and make do but from a Buddhist point of view, we can be completely cured. So we've got our afflictive emotions, all of the disturbances, the, the, the feelings that overwhelm us, all of our distorted states of mind and prejudices and fears and hopes and worries and anxieties. And they, um, they're kind of like our default baseline, but they are not at the core of our being. They are all disturbances on the surface. And the Buddhist understanding of, of ourselves is that at the core, we are good and pure and clear. Uh, so that is pretty radical. Uh, and it's, it's not something that you have to believe. It's something that you can find out through your own observation and through logic and reasoning. All of the good qualities that we possess, that natural sense of of fairness, natural compassion, natural care, how human beings help each other in a disaster when they recognize suffering, they naturally help, even at the expense of their own life. All of those qualities are there at the core of our being. So from a Buddhist point of view, we can um, change our mind, we can change our heart, we can rewire our brain, and it's us, we can change ourselves. So in a way, be your own therapist. Well, Buddha was the ultimate therapist and uh, the Buddha has shown us that it can be done and we can also walk in the Buddha's footsteps and become um, healed, heal ourselves. So what we're going to have a look at, uh, let's see, today, uh, today I thought the main topic can be uh, setting our motivation because we're at the beginning. So how to set a good motivation and the power of a really good motivation. So we'll have a little moment to um, do a little formal motivation. 
I've got a couple of slides for the topic and then um, I really hope you've got lots of questions and examples and things uh, to get the conversation going. You'll be able to either raise your virtual hand um, or your physical hand, or if you're shy and want to stay in the back of the room and or if you're in a public place and can't talk, then put it into the chat and Shayla will be able to ask um, the questions on your behalf. Um, so our, the other thing about being our own therapist is that what we think are the problems aren't necessarily the problems. And in fact, our problems and unhappiness can become our friends. They can become our guides because any problems that we have show us exactly where we have to look in our own psychology. Any turmoil, emotional upset that we have, that's a result of something. So that's where we start looking. What caused it? So actually, all of our unhappiness and all of our problems, they're our friends. They're the messenger. They show us where to look. And what's tricky is how to look, how to analyse. This is something that doesn't come naturally because we get so overwhelmed by the suffering that we just don't have any space um, in, in our experience to do something about it. And the Buddhist psychology, so fundamentally different from Western psychology, is that um, it isn't, it's not just shut up and make do but we can actually experience ultimate and lasting happiness. That is something we can aim for. And we must have the courage to aim for. Uh, and we can have help from the Buddha and Buddha's teachings and all of the, the spiritual community um, to guide us along the way. So with that little preamble, folks, uh, here is the ultimate therapist, Buddha on the couch, and one day <laughs> this can be us too, happy on the couch, just chilling and there for sentient beings. So uh, let's take a moment to uh, set our um, motivation. And um, I'll read this out in a moment, but uh, before I do read it out, just uh, get your posture with a nice balance between having a straight back and being relaxed. So to kind of straighten your spine, pull your shoulders back so your whole chest and heart areas open. Take a couple of deep breaths and think, for starters, how fantastic I've made it here today. So many people have an inclination to do something with their life to help themselves and the opportunity is not there or the opportunity is there but circumstances prevail and they don't get there but here we are how fortunate how wonderful to be here together and so our motivation here's one from Lamieshi, which is lovely what is the purpose of being alive today there must be something more important than drinking coffee today I'll develop bodhicitta, leading to the peaceful path of liberation and full awakening for the benefit of all beings. From this moment on, until I go to sleep, I shall stay aware of every action of my body, speech and mind. And wherever possible, I shall try to help. And at the very least, I will not harm. <laughs> So if you want, take a photo of, uh, of this motivation because uh, it's great. You can have it in your phone. You can have it as your opening um, screen to remind you. Um, and I, I think it's so skillful because it goes from the absolute certainty of every morning for me, which is coffee, <laughs> and it hitchhikes on something that I already do that I don't have to concentrate on and remember and, you know, get back on the wagon like I do, drink my coffee every morning without fail. So I can hitchhike on that to make sure that I incorporate everything else that's important of the day, the main things, which is this altruistic attitude, the good heartedness and really getting the big picture. Why am I alive and how am I going to do it? So, 
So with, with the motivation, it's good to have the words to frame it um, because otherwise we just have a general amorphous feeling and that can very easily be derailed. So whatever motivation you have, try and get very clear actually be very specific be clear make it long term and make it altruistic and then it becomes strong and it is worth um, putting it in your own words or finding some poetry or something that enthuses you and inspires your mind it doesn't have to be all dry and just dot points it can it can be beautiful and what those short, succinct motivations are is like a shorthand to remind you of the whole feeling and background to it. It doesn't necessarily have to be religious. So it can be, at the very least, I've got to look after my family and everyone my family is associated with and uh, to be able to help other families as well rather than hinder them <laughs> for the sake of my own to be able to contribute to society, to give back as much as I've got, um, to be able to invent something or share something, whatever we do, world's best practice, whether it's researching something in science or whether it's just cleaning a hospital, whether it's taking the weeds out of your garden, do it the very best that you can, world's best practice. Doesn't matter if anyone notices or not, it's gonna be good for us. So the power of a good motivation, I suppose we're going to look at um, what is it that drives us as our baseline. So ask yourself, uh, what makes you get out of bed in the morning? <laughs> Apart from you have to go to the loo. Uh, why do we get out of bed? Or, you know, sometimes maybe we don't get out of bed. Maybe we go to the loo and we come back and we just stay under the doona for the whole time. So what is it that makes us get up? Uh, what propels us into the day? And I, I think actually, usually it's a default. It's something quite unconscious. It's what's driving us underneath. And it might be just the clamor of day-to-day -day life. I've got to pay a bill. I've got to get the kids to school. Just these mundane things. And that just crashes in on us, doesn't it? It's just unrelenting and it's a real drag and after a while you know some people just give up and go you know what it's not worth it because because the motivation is so short term just to that immediacy we may have a driving motivation um that's also a default there that might be to do with say proving our parents wrong <laughs> so i've got a friend who grew up in a family of boys and um, it, was, it was quite a um, kind of a traditional family. So all the boys got to go to school and then uni and the girls had to leave school at grade 10, uh, didn't get to finish their education, had to go out and work because, you know, girls aren't that smart. So she spent her whole life trying to prove herself to her, to her parents and it became this driving factor underneath. Sometimes we might even call it a chip on, chip on your shoulder. Um, but everything that she did was motivated by this. But because it wasn't brought into awareness, um, it was like this hunger of always needing the approval of her parents and nothing was ever enough because she couldn't actually get the approval herself. She couldn't approve of herself. Her parents weren't ever going to change and then they got old and died. And so then what do you do? <laughs> So this unconscious driver, it can really galvanize us, but it's not necessarily healthy. Um, we might just have a goal. We just may be a born hedonist, you know, I'm just gonna get what I can and have fun. We become a foodie or a drug addict or, you know, whatever it is, a shopaholic. <laughs> and we just consume and consume as well. And while we have the circumstances, we can do it. But once those circumstances change, then we're in real trouble. Once we become allergic to a food or we get, you know, our liver, liver and gallbladder are just overloaded from too much delicious food, then what do we do? We might be driven by a sense of panic. Oh, my God, I've got to do this. I've got to do that. 
<laughs> uh, we may be so overcome by depression that we don't get up, that we can't even have a shower or dress ourselves. Um, so maybe this has given you an idea of, well, what is it that's, that's driving me? What is that baseline driver? So from a Buddhist point of view, uh, the, the Buddhist psychology is a little different because I know in, in Western psychology, we have this idea of here's our motivation, but underneath is some other dark motivation that's not true. <laughs> there's an inner saboteur or maybe I've got the exact opposite one and we second guess ourselves and we doubt. Um, but actually, from a Buddhist point of view, we have whatever our default motivation is, it's, we're just unaware of it. Then we shine the light of wisdom on it and we look with courage. It's okay. You, it's, you don't have to be politically correct here. You can look. It's all right. Because then we just adjust our motivation. So you start wherever you are, it's a big mess. And then you go, oh, that bit's a mess. I'm going to adjust that and make it better. And you go, oh, that bit's pretty good. I'm going to make it stronger. Simple, isn't it? I wish I had been told this years ago because I've spent so many years doubting myself. But actually, if you think anyone who leads a meditation, they'll always say, now let's set our motivation or let's adjust our motivation. It's, it's that simple. We just got to bring awareness to it and then practice it. So um, our, one of our teachers here quite a few years ago, Geshe Jamyang, said it's like, um, so we, you know, what drives us, what gets us out of bed, the clearer the goal, the stronger our success. If we set a positive motivation in the morning, it carries us throughout the day and it is like a long jump. Everything depends on the run-up. <laughs> Once you're in the air, there's very little you can do. So what's the run-up to the day? It's setting our motivation. And then we're off in the right direction and we have impetus. If we forget to set our motivation, what happens? We have to keep doing it again and again and again throughout the day. I saw on Facebook this <laughs> saying, and it blew my mind. What would you be doing right now if you knew you could not fail? Isn't that wonderful? So that really puts the, um, it's, it's like a, a stealth Buddhist approach, isn't it? Because from a Buddhist point of view, we have a potential, a natural potential to become a Buddha enlightened. So if we knew we could do that, it's just a matter of time, what would we be doing right now? We knew, if we knew we couldn't fail, this is our natural uh, you know, birthright of all living beings, what would we be doing? <laughs> I know I'd be doing a little bit less if I just remembered this. <laughs> I'd be doing less of that and more of that. So, um, any questions so far about uh, what's driving us, this, you know, our, our default motivation and um, any thoughts or queries or uh, anything to add before we go on? <sighs> too much, too fast? <laughs> no. <laughs> so remember, if you're too shy to ask a question, you can just stick it in the chat and Shyla can ask or else um, there is a little button there. Um, it's under reactions and you can raise a virtual hand. Um, so when I was thinking about this, what, how we set our motivation, there was a sentence that jumped out at me, you know, in the FPMT gold prayer book and in there is quite a detailed Shakyamuni Buddha meditation somewhere in the middle there. And there's just one line in it where it says, um, of the two types of motivation, the causal motivation and the momentary motivation. This is the most powerful, the causal one. And I'm like, what does that even mean? For starters, when I saw causal motivation and momentary motivation, what I actually saw was casual motivation and momentary motivation. I thought, oh, cool. You can have a casual motivation. Uh-uh, no, totally the opposite. Causal motivation. 
So this um, really prompted me to find, well, what's, what's the go here? Two types of motivation. And this is what I found really interesting. So we've got causal motivation, which is the one that starts your day. And it can be that default one that we're largely unaware of, but it's our driver through life. Whether we have, we're, we're really ambitious, whether we're a complete hedonist, uh, whether we're frightened and we're just trying to avoid conflict challenges, um, whether we're depressed, it can also be whether we have um, this yearning to benefit others, to make our life meaningful, to contribute in some way. Um, a causal motivation, what starts your day. So anyone who's worked as a first responder has to have a really strong one of this and remind themselves why they're going to work each day because it, otherwise you burn out. And so the causal motivation is, is to benefit others. And because you have an immediate response from those others, immediate um, people right there in front of you, you remember your causal motivation again and again. Um, but that causal motivation might deteriorate a bit. It might just become you're so burnt out, you're just doing it for the money now to just pay the bills. And we can see where that's going, can't we? So the causal motivation, um, if we bring awareness to it, we can make it strong and it directs our day. And then we don't have to keep remembering, why am I here? What am I doing this job for? Because we've set our motivation. Even if our job is just being cleaner, we, we've, if we've set our motivation, we won't have to keep uh, giving ourselves a pep talk. We'll have the energy. The second one, the momentary motivation. Uh, so this is what happens in the spur of the moment. Something happens and you react. The motivation in the moment, the momentary motivation. So it is reactive. And what's going to flavor how we react? What we did in the morning, our causal motivation. So this momentary motivation is to do with each situation and it's really heavily influenced by our tone of the day, our mood and, and how we've adjusted our motivation. Um, it's, so, so we can see that motivation is quite complex. Um, from, from a uh, Western point of view, I spent a lot of time back in my 20s reading Nietzsche. Nietzsche was my absolute hero. And he talked about like a, a, a will to power. This is like our causal motivation that's unconscious. And we have a urge for fame or domination or acknowledgement. And it's often our lowest common denominator, and it's often driven by the afflictions. It's not driven by, um, you know, the universal altruistic qualities. In a very materialistic society, we have a will to money, <laughs> a will for we to wealth, to be upwardly mobile, to have status, to accumulate more, and to be seen to be a success. If we're a hedonist, we have a will to pleasure. <laughs> Anything will do. And the best one of that was the poor old guy in The Wolf of Wall Street. I love that movie because it's, it's such a mixed bag, isn't it? He had such gusto. <laughs> you know, he's like the Iggy Pop of Wall Street. You know, he just had a lust for life. But he was a materialist. It, it, was, just, it was just the material things, this one life. Just, just what we can experience now, a complete hedonist. But he had the courage to just go for everything and when he had everything, then to have more. And there's this fantastic scene where they're in the middle of the ocean in a tiny yacht. There's a thunderstorm. They're about to sink. And his one thought is, quick, get the drugs, snort some cocaine, let's have more. <laughs> I just thought, man... If you took that attitude to the Bodhisattva path, he'd just be streets ahead, but he just didn't have a path. So he, he had this will to pleasure, a materialistic path. Such a waste. 
but so, so courageous. So, um, you know, instead we can have, we can, we can set our um, motivation and we can adjust it to be a really long-term investment in humanity and in ourselves. It doesn't have to be all of those kind of um, baseline will to power or will to fame or will to pleasure or any of those other ones. Uh, so tell me what, um, now that I've been talking for a while, what, what motivations have you found? Have you discovered or thought, oh, maybe I've got that one. You, you kind of baseline driving force. What are the ones that come to mind? One of you has to say, or I'm going to have to ask one of you. <laughs> I'll start. Oh, thank you, Shayla. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I used to have a hard time waking up in the morning and I decided I'm going to get up at 6.30. I'm going to have my coffee. I'm going to get in the shower, eat breakfast and just have a nice, peaceful morning, you know? Imagine that <laughs> instead yeah. of doing the flight of the bumblebee, you know, <laughs> um, but it took me a while, quite a while to, to do it. And now I've added meditation. <laughs> oh, yeah, but that's a great start, isn't it? So, so, um, so what you've actually carved out some space, you've made some space and that's a big deal because normally we just go, oh, if it happens to us, <laughs> but yes. here you've made space for something. So what was it that made you carve out that space? I, I, I felt like I was, my life was so chaotic, was so, um, I didn't have control over anything. I was being reactive instead of proactive. I was just, mm. just responding and I, I needed some peace. And so that cup of coffee in the morning, it, you know, instead of going to Starbucks and buying it, you know, I make it now here at my house and saving some money. Um, but also, yeah. Also, yeah. the weather's so changed. You, I'm that's outside. almost like... Um you know, that when you recognize your life is so chaotic, that's almost like then your problem becomes your friend because it's just like this is this can't happen anymore. It's just like so much in your face that it's telling you you have to do something. Absolutely. Well, I, you, you, I've had, you know, 50 years of me, you know, trying to keep up um, because I'm always behind. I slept in. Yeah. And so now it's. It's nice yeah. to go to work on time. And if I am late, it's because I chose to be um, because I was enjoying you yep. know, my little time. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, that's great. So that's really, that's that's how we can take control of our life by not trying to control all of those things, but just like you did, you take control of your side. So in that way, it's it's like it's blindingly simple. And yet why does it take us so long to actually get there? Because most of the time we're looking at all of those problems out there and thinking to change them. Yes. So this is, um, but uh, like uh, I'm really impressed, Shayla, because don't underestimate how hard it is to change, like to actually do those first initial things. And um, we have to have a really big incentive. So to recognize, oh, I need some peace. <laughs> and it's the only way I get it is me. <laughs> yeah, it's taken me probably a good six, eight months just to get up and stay up um, or drink my coffee and then crawl back in bed and go to sleep. Um, <laughs> I don't know how I can do it, but I did. <laughs> yeah, yep. Um, I think there is a question from Alicia. Can you read that out? For me? I'd love to. I think I have had a motivation to help others, but often that has been driven by the need to prove myself as being a good person or to make up for the perception of past mistakes rather than genuinely benefiting others for their and my sake. This has been helpful um, to realize and work on adjusting mm. to a more beneficial motivation led less by 
fear not being enough mm. and attachment to reputation, et cetera, and more by a genuine wish to benefit others and my own mm. mind. That's beautiful. Mm. Yeah, so it's right. That's all there, Alicia, isn't it? You've got what's called a mixed motivation. And just putting it out like that, you can see how it's mixed. So you take those bits of, of course, you genuinely want to help others. So don't second guess that bit. <laughs> That's there. And then what can happen is there can be other influences to that, like um, to, to prove others wrong or to, um, to feel l legitimate or worthwhile in the world. Um, those kind of things can come in and influence it. But if you can spot them, they don't have to corrupt your good intentions. So um, we can kind of notice when our intentions start being a bit corrupted, like we, you know, we, of course, we want to help. But then um, we start feeling that we need some acknowledgement for that. And so then we've got to look at our need for acknowledgement. And often that comes because we've started thinking that um, the way that we can help is dependent on what we can do in the world. And if we can't do something in the world, we're not good enough. But actually, what um, counts most is the intention to help. And whether we're successful at it one day or not, uh, whether things come together or they don't, that goes up and down. But what we can keep strong and steady is always keep the intention to help. And if that is strong, then whether people recognize us or not, it won't matter so much. But it's kind of this slide that happens, which is really natural, that we go from our impetus and then we latch on to the external circumstances and then we forget about our internal thing and we just go, oh, I want to help this person. And then we haven't been able to help them. And then we think we're a failure. <laughs> you see how it slid from inside to the external. So, um, and that's just natural. That's just this habit that we have. It's, it's always going to be there. But the thing is to notice, oh, I'm just sliding now and bring it back inwards to what's our intention. Our intention is there, whether we're a success or not, our intentions to help. Yeah. Um, so, and then that makes that intention stronger. Um, and like I said, never ever second guess that one, just, just support it. And the best way to support our good intentions is with those, with the four immeasurables, the four immeasurable attitudes. So, you know, great loving kindness and great compassion that encompasses everybody. So it's not biased. It's not just for me and mine, but it's for everybody. And that will really strengthen your, um, that natural feeling. Because uh, the natural feeling usually is just associated with who's there immediately in front of us. We think to help them. <laughs> And the, the people on the other side of the world or the people from a different culture to us, we don't really think about them. And that's why it's a bit weak. So if we, if you have, you start off with that really strong feeling and then you strengthen it with the four measurables. It'll be dynamite. <laughs> Thanks, Alicia. Um, Anisha, hello. Hello. Um, nice to see you, Rippy. Nice I just, yeah, I thought what Alicia said was really good. Um, I remember Venerable Rabina mentioned once that one of the very, uh, you know, deepest kind of um, our attachments that uh, uh, propel us and that can sometimes hinder us in our happiness is this uh attachment to our reputation like how other people see us or yeah uh, but then yeah that can sometimes actually hinder our our happiness because then we may only do things that we think that other people will you know yeah. like us so and you know it may not actually be things that you know benefit others that even if other people don't see us we should still be benefiting right like yep um, yeah that's right so one of the things I've heard is um like if you're going to do a good deed don't put it on Facebook <laughs> don't yeah. tell anyone and see if that feels different from 
kind of advertising yourself mm-hmm. <laughs> and just you know just do a good deed in secret um so i mean this is why like um if fundraisers and things like that um they they recognize our need uh, our attachment to reputation so they always go you know post that you signed this mm. petition or post that you've made this donation let everybody know um, because that way we uh, telegraph to everybody what a fantastic person we are. <laughs> so they know they've got the psychology of that down pat. So it's really good to do secret acts of kindness just as a, as a temperature, take your own temperature kind of thing <laughs> to see how and attached we are to reputation. I had a few other questions, Miffy. Um, one was, you know, when we're helping others, how do we distinguish between what is actually helpful for that person and what is what I think will be helpful for that person and then because sometimes I find that you know I'm like oh I'm going to help this person Mm. but then it may just be oh I think this is going to be helpful then but it may not actually help them (laughs) and then I may just feel frustrated because they're not doing what I think will help them you know and then my second this is wait 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 this is like this is the question that I ask myself every day Anisha because I just think what, what am I going to say to people? How do I know if what I'm saying to people is helpful <laughs> or if I'm just like mansplaining to everybody yeah. or if I'm giving everyone a bum steer completely? Like, how can you tell? It's a good question. <laughs> so then, so what's your, the second part? Oh, uh, the second part was a different question. I just wanted to, you mentioned earlier on the causal motivation is more important than the yeah. uh, other one, why that was the case. Why yeah, is it so, more important? so actually those two, the, the, the questions are related because um, how do we know if what we're going to do is going to help? We don't know. Uh, so because of that, and even if it is going to help, is the person going to take the help? Are circumstances going to change? So that we don't know. So how can we ensure that we have harm minimization? and that we have the best possible op- you know, options there in, in front of us, it's with the causal motivation. So we make sure we really adjust our reason for helping. And if we're as good-hearted as we can be, if we're still going to help, even if the person's rude to us, even if they slander us, we're, we're not going to go back on our intention to help them, that's our safety mechanism. That's how we can tell. And then the rest is skills. Then it's cause and it's what trial and error, <laughs> slowly developing your skills. And that's where a whole lot of um, Western psychology and self-help books and people's biographies and everything is very helpful for the just day-to-day skills. But what they miss out is how to keep it, keep it safe, fundamentally safe, and that's the causal motivation because it sets the direction. And once you're off in that direction, and if you've made it altruistic, long term, you've weeded out all of your own, you know, concerns and need for reputation and everything, then it's really strong. Then even if everything goes pear shaped, even if the help doesn't work, people don't want the help, the harm that comes from that is going to be much smaller. So you can then have courage. (laughs) <laughs> mm, yeah because one thing I've noticed when I'm working in the stupa like there's so many wonderful people that come you know they're so kind and care about others around them but then sometimes uh when they wish to help for others but then what they want is not kind of happening then it they feel disturbed you know yeah um, and it feels like they need help rather than you yeah know, in other situations so yeah. yeah, that's right. So that's when we're getting attached to the results. We're, so, again, we've gone from the inner, the, the urge to help, to the outer, being attached to seeing a good result. And, um, you know, so if, you've ha- if, if, if you yourself or any of your friends uh, have an addiction, for instance, um, this is where it really comes into play because, we can't give up on the, the wish to help them, but we have to give up on the actual helping them, the physical helping them, because you can't. Until they've, they've reached wrong bot- rock bottom, until they're finished, 
you can't help them. And so usually what happens is people will go, they're so upset that they can't help that they go, that's it, I give up. And they, and they stop feeling wanting to help in their heart. <laughs> and why that happens is because we get attached to the result. So we always keep the wish to help. And the result may or may not come. Thank you. <laughs> so I've got a couple of examples here of causal and um, momentary. Oh, here we go, just before to finish this one. So adjusting our motivation each morning. Um, so very, very minimum. This is how we can do it. Today I'm going to try and benefit whenever I can. So if there's an opportunity, I'm going to try and benefit. And at the very least, I will not harm. So, so this is something every single one of us can do. We can, we can harm minimization. We can make sure that our presence in the world is not going to harm anyone around us. Everyone around us will is safe. Even if I'm in a fit of rage, I know I'm not going to express it and harm them. So they're safe. <laughs> Like a lovely time for sinner, doesn't matter what I'm thinking in my mind. I've I've never yelled at anyone in anger. I've never yelled at anyone. I've been here 25 years and I've never yelled at anyone. So they're safe with me in that respect. So that's something that we can we can commit to. And then if you can help, great. If you can't externally help, you still have that intention. So this is a great one. Print it out and put it on your mirror in the morning or in, you know doing your teeth i'll stay aware of my every action of my body speech and mind and not allow anything to upset me this is also great so um you know i've been going through a bit of a hard time in the last few months kind of you know the long-term effects of the, the upheaval of the world with covid so with all this turmoil you you even if it's emotional turmoil, you don't let it upset you. So it's there, but you don't let it rule your world. And how do we do that? We just stay aware. What am I doing? What am I saying? What's my mind dwelling on? You know, nice and gentle. And then from His Holiness, <laughs> whenever possible, I'll show kindness. It's always possible. <laughs> That's also a great one. <laughs> so this is how to adjust our motivation. Um, then I thought I'd give you a couple of examples of um, functional and dysfunctional. So um, one, human sexuality, okie dokie. So we've got functional and dysfunctional. So if you're in a partnership and you have a healthy relationship, the causal motivation is of course you want you know if you're having sex you want the other person to have pleasure as much as you want yourself to have pleasure but it's more than that isn't it you want to be able to have connection human connection to share emotion to be open to be vulnerable so the causal motivation in a healthy relationship is actually about real deep human to human communication but if it's just that causal mo motivation <laughs> and the momentary one of desire or lust isn't there, then it's just a platonic relationship, isn't it? But the momentary mo motivation, yeah, you're never going to get in the sack. You're never going to have sex unless you actually have some desire or lust. So that's there. But you can see what's motivating it is fundamentally healthy. But most of our relationships well, anyway, many of the relationships that me and my friends have had have been dysfunctional. So the causal motivation, what's driving it, has just been like pure hedonism, just, just out for oneself. I just want to feel good. Um, but it can also be things like um, power, the wish to dominate somebody, to, um, to have power over someone to be able to, you know, change their entire emotional well-being with just a word. Um, or it can be narcissism, the need to feel um, beautiful or sexy or wanted. 
you know, all about me. It would just be neediness, terror of being alone. So many times this has been our causal motivation for a relationship, long-term, short-term, even just a one-night stand. It's been these under un, uh, un, unconscious drivers. While the momentary motivation might be very nice, you might be quite romantic, you might bring flowers and chocolates, you might be very attentive and polite, charming. And so it all looks good. But this is why things go wrong. Because even though the momentary motivation, you know, you're attracted to someone, you flirt, you have a nice time, it all seems fine. But what's driving it? What's driving it is often this attachment to reputation, narcissism, neediness. And so then, um, you know, then, then we may ha end up having a relationship. And then after, you know, a few months, we just feel lonely in the relationship and we can't figure out why. Or we get bored or the person starts annoying us. <laughs> why does this happen? Because our causal motivation was fundamentally flawed. Why? Because we weren't uh, honest. We weren't honest with ourselves. So again, um, I've noticed in relationships, there can be, after about the three-month mark, there's a fork in the road. <laughs> and you either split up or something happens and and you kind of bond some some disaster or you have an argument and you you get real you actually become more honest something happens and you change and it becomes the causal motivation now becomes more human to human more about being authentic and and open and vulnerable or some disaster happens and you all pull together and it becomes a deep bonding experience and that's what brings a relationship together but if that doesn't happen you just split up go on to the next one and the next one and the next one <laughs> so this has a really fundamental effect on our human interactions whether it's a sexual relationship or or not it can also be why you know so many so many kids these days are growing up and their first experience of sexuality is porn. You know, I think most kids have seen porn by the age of 10 or 12 years old. Um, so often they'll think that's the only thing, that's what sex is, is just porn. And so even if you have a good time, the hollowness and alienation that you feel afterwards after having sex is just overwhelming. And this is a real tragedy. I mean, this is terrible, isn't it? And why? Because we're not aware of the causal motivation. It's got to be more than just hedonistic pleasure. Um, that is just going to lead to disaster. So let alone a spiritual path, let alone becoming enlightened or liberated from the machinery of samsara, just basic human relationships are not going to work unless we become aware of this one. So that was one of them. Um, <laughs> anyone brave enough to have any questions about that? <laughs> questions, comments? I mean, the relationship one is a, it's a biggie, isn't it? Most of us are in some form of relationship. And even, even if it's just, you know, like a platonic relationship with best friends, um, why do best friends break up in the end? Often it's because our causal motivation has been quite destructive. We've just... We've had a symbiotic relationship where we just feed each other's neuroses. And after a while, you know, of course, then we split apart and we can't figure out why. <laughs> and yet you can have a good causal motivation. Um, and that's what I found so amazing here at Lungry Tompa Center. So a, a vastly varied wide range of human beings like you take a photo of everybody you couldn't tell what are, what do these people have in common no way to tell <laughs> I mean and that, that's fantastic isn't it and so many people I have very little in common with until you get to below the surface to just 
basic human beings, the human condition, and all the problems that human beings have. And once you get below that, then suddenly everybody matters, which is great, isn't it? So I've found if you set up the causal motivation here, what am I here for? I'm, I'm, I'm here to help fellow human beings, regardless of what's happening on the surface. Um, that means that I can actually, since I've been here at Lungry Thomas Center, I've felt a connection with human beings instead of feeling completely alienated from society. So that's been a real change in my life, completely changed. Um, Vanessa. <laughs> oh, hang on. Uh, are you going to unmute? Sorry about yep. that. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> As far as like friendship wise, I noticed like for me, I haven't had friends for a long time. Like I had friends, but not like a deep connection or a best friend or a group of friends. But I just find like with my experience, it's always, like you said, feeding neurosis. And it gets to the point where it's like, I'm so turned off by, you know, the thought of certain friendships and but in, yeah. but then like on the other side, it's like it gets kind of lonely, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's kind of good that you're turned off by those kind of that those kind of friendships and because kind of being sick of it all that's that's the starting point and um so what i've what i've noticed is that um you need to have some kind of bonding experience to help you below the surface and often this happens when you volunteer so when you volunteer um, in emergencies or, you, you know, you, you volunteer with food drops or you volunteer for natural disasters. Uh, I've just recently been watching this show about volunteers uh, on um, life rafts along the English coast, you know, and they, and they save people get, getting drowning in the sea or their ship is sunk or whatever. And they're all just volunteers. And so, but they're saving lives and they're putting themselves at risk and they're doing something that's meaningful to them and they're doing it together. And so all of the, the normal things of being with people so that they like how we look, so they entertain us, they tell us jokes, so it's nice, so we relax, all of that stuff, that's not the point. Actually, it's physically challenging. You're cold, you're wet, you're terrified and you're with strangers, but you're doing something meaningful. And so the friendships that come from that are deep and enduring. Mm. They're really different from the friendships that we get because we just entertain each other. Right. So, you know, find, find, um, and I mean, that's, that's often why people join volunteer groups because, because of our deep loneliness that we have. And at least in a something and a, a place to or to, that's that, that you volunteer, it is doing good in society. So you feel good about that, even if you feel miserable. <laughs> and then you meet other people that also care. So until I came to Lungry Thomas Center, the only people place that I met people was in the pub. <laughs> so you can imagine the kind of friendships I had. I mean. You could make lots of movies about it. We had great adventures, uh, super entertaining. Am I friends with any of those people now? Uh, two. And they're both at Lungry Tumper Centre. <laughs> but everybody else, gone. 15 years of rabble rousing and adventures. What fun. Anything to show for it? Very little. Mm. Okay. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, so find find something where you where you can get involved, but it, it it also means something to you what you're doing, because that will get you through the weirdness of people <laughs> and their foibles, and and instead of people annoying you, you, you'll just kind of grow to love their foibles because what you're doing is something actually meaningful together. Right. Okay. Oh, we're almost out of time. I haven't even given the second example. <laughs> Here we go. I've got my second example for you guys. So becoming a doctor, okay? So being a doctor, you'd think it's a great thing to try and be. 
So if 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 your uh, so the functional uh, instead of the dysfunctional, the the healthy motivation, a causal wish to help others. You you see suffering and you want to alleviate suffering. You want to help others, and having that wish gets you through university, gets you through those interminable years, gets you through sitting exams. You're not thinking about, oh, I hate exams and statistics. You're thinking, if I get through this, I'll be able to help people. So you've got a really strong causal motivation and it's altruistic. It's about others. Um, but the momentary one, you may have to give yourself some tricks. You know, if I do this statistics, and I get through this exam, I'm going to give myself a two-week holiday <laughs> or I'm going to try and ace the top of my class or whatever it is. So you need a momentary motivation, but it must be informed by this bigger one. So that's the best of all possible worlds, isn't it? But um, I've been to some shocking doctors. And honestly, I've been to doctors that have said, Oh, don't you worry about that, Miffy. You don't need to know about that. Just trust me. <laughs> and it's like a red flag. So many, many doctors are there through a dysfunctional reason that they got good grades in school. And um, so they were just pushed into this stream of being a doctor. They don't actually like people. Um they don't even like touching people. <laughs> they certainly don't like explaining anything to people. Or they're there for status, uh, for being a doctor, even a particular type of doctor. Or it used to be you're there for the money. I mean, there's actually, if you're a GP, there's not much money in it. But hey, if you're a plastic surgeon, there's a lot of money in it. So, uh, or it could be that because you got good grades in school, even though you wanted to be a cello player, you were forced to be a doctor. And so you don't you don't want to be a doctor, but you're good at it. So you make do. But your heart was in playing the cello. So you can see the causal motivation, it can be quite mixed. On the surface, the momentary motivation. And this is what's happened to me with doctors. They, yeah, they have a wish to please you, to help you. Um, and they're friendly. But the moment you challenge them, they just lose it. The moment you challenge their status, their expertise, or even perceived challenge, the moment you ask why, or can you explain that? It's like, how very dare you? Do you know I'm the best doctor on the, on the South Coast? No one talks to me like that. And in fact, I've had friends who the doctor has stormed out in a huff <laughs> and refused to treat them. Can you imagine a doctor saying, don't you know who I am and stormed out? And they were in hospital in their hospital bed. And what, what did that come from? That come from them just asking a question. So that shows the fragility that if your causal motivation isn't to help others, you might be the best in your field. Yeah. You might be earning pots of money and you might be um, giving lectures at international conferences but one middle-aged woman asking you a question can cause you to lose your shit <laughs> so and then you know if that's happened to you then you can you can start doubting the entire profession which is which is disastrous also so you know it plays out everywhere doesn't it um brian you've got a question or a comment uh, just a comment, and I'll be brief because I know we're out of time. Um, but this is just so relevant because back in my 30s, I decided that I wanted to do my pre-med. And I took leaves of absence from my job, and for four years I studied. What I realized is that the only reason I was doing it to prove to myself that I wasn't an idiot, which is not the reason. And then as an observation, looking at all the kids I studied with, either there were the kids that were very passionate about wanting to go into medicine and you could tell they were gonna be excellent doctors. Then there were the kids that come from richer families where they're fat, their parents were doctors. It was expected of them. They weren't necessarily into it either. And 
it was very interesting to see the dynamic. And I, I'm glad I realized in the third year when we did anatomy lab and we worked on cadavers, it freaked me out. <laughs> but see, I'd love to do that. I'd just, yeah. you know. <laughs> There were kids that were just, this is such an honor. I can't believe how amazing this is. And I knew right away, I'm doing it for the wrong reasons. Yeah. And they're going to be very good at, in this profession. Mm. Yeah. So just an yeah. observation. Wow. Fantastic. And fantastic that you saw it too and that you didn't go into medicine. I mean, because that that is rare. It's rare to be able to see, oh, I'm in it for the wrong reasons, and then to be able to actually change direction so and I think it made me realize then that whatever you want to do you should really have a passion for it even anything anything you yeah. do have a passion for it yeah and even if even if what you want to do is a thing that you're not interested in and you want to do it for the money even if you're doing it for the money you have to have a passion for what's the money for so it can just be, oh, yeah, I'm stacking shelves. Well, I don't have a passion for stacking shelves, but with this money, this is what I'm going to do it, do with it. So whatever it is, it's got to be what's it for. So um, that actually, and thank you, Brian, that's just the cherry on top for me that you've got that observation. Uh, so setting the safe direction then, a safe direction, which means what's our motivation? So one way that we can start working on it right now is to ask, why am I doing this? And ask why three times to go deeper. So you go, well, why, why am I stacking shelves? Well, because I need the paycheck. Why do I need the paycheck? Oh, I've got to pay the rent, blah, blah, blah. Why do you have to pay the rent? Well, because I want to live. And I want to make something of my life. And this is what I'm going to do. So you keep asking why until you get to these fundamental core inner reasons. And that will mean that even if we don't, even if we lose our job, we don't lose our reason for living. <laughs> so this one, asking why three times minimum is really effective and write it down. Don't just say it in your head, write it down. So it's like with the maths, you can see the working. The other thing that we can do is ask, who are our people? Who are we doing it for? Who are we living for? So um, generally we have a cohort of people that we relate with. So I, I relate with a lot of artists and I relate with um, autistic people and I relate with kind of social outcasts, they're my people. <laughs> they're the ones close to my heart, the misfits, the, um, the socially inept, the bumbling along, clumsy, say it out loud and go, whoops, all those people, they're my people. That's who I'm here for, number one. <laughs> That's who I'm living for. So that gives you this really uh, a personal impetus that's bigger than yourself. And it, it flavors everything. It means you're also playing to your strengths, to, to who you love. And then you expand it out to include everybody. But you've, you've made it really authentic to start with and then expand it out. The third way to set our safe direction, set our motivation is to connect with your support, with those who have gone before, with our refuge, with our lineage, our spiritual mentors, with all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, um, you know, with if we're going to be a doctor, with all of those doctors, you know, through through history that have changed the world. And we and we draw on their support and we feel them there for us. Where where the result of them. And they are our support. And then we won't ever feel alone. Even if we are alone, we, we're not alone. <laughs> and this I have found incredibly beneficial. You know, reading about the stories of, of the life stories of various artists. And again, we've got to come back to his holiness. Whenever possible, I will show kindness and it's always possible. <laughs> so. Let's, um, we're going to dedicate 
Oh, I've gone over a little bit, but we'll take one moment to, to dedicate. Just in your mind, think um, one thing that stood out to you that you can that that made a difference in your mind today. And then also one thing that you can implement this week, one thing that you can do differently this week from what we've discussed today. And then let's dedicate all of this, uh, your courage in sharing and uh, your efforts in getting here and staying. <laughs> and here's the dedication. Due to all the merits of the three times accumulated by me and by others, merely by seeing, hearing, remembering, touching or talking to me, may any being be freed in that very second from all their sufferings, diseases, spirit harms, negative karmas and obscurations and abide in the peerless happiness of full enlightenment forever. So that means that just by existing in the world, you're going to be beneficial. <laughs> so thank you so much, everyone. Um, I hope to see you again uh, sooner or later and at the very least uh, next week, um, same time, same place. Thank you.